Hey everybody, uh, this is Chuck, the museum historian, and today I want to take a deep dive into the blast doors for you. Uh, you see them on the tours, but we don't talk much about them except, you know, how much they weigh and all that kind of stuff. But there's a lot to the blast door system uh, that's kind of interesting. I thought maybe it'd be uh, kind of cool to talk about today, so let's do that. Uh, we have four blast doors in the complex, and those four doors are numbered six, seven, eight, and nine. And the reason for that took us a little while to figure out. So if you just if you just think of these as doors, so not blast doors, just doors, uh, and then you think of the main gate topside as being door one, then you can count doors all the way down to here so that this ends up being door six. That's all there is to it. Come on in the blast lock here. Now, on the tours, we tell you that only one door of a pair of these doors can be opened at a time. So for example, when a crew comes on board in the morning, uh, they open door six, they find door seven closed and locked. Before they can open door seven, they have to close door six behind them. That way, if a bomb goes off when somebody's coming or going, blast can never get any further than door seven. Everything inside is safe. The blast wave can never fully penetrate the complex. We have two more doors over here, doors eight and nine. Take a look. This is door 8, goes into the control center, door 9 goes down to the silo. Uh, and these work in the same way, only one of a pair can be opened at a time. So doors 6 and 7 that we just saw, those are designed to protect you from a nuclear blast. These two doors are designed to protect you from your own missile. So if the missile exploded like it did in Little Rock, Arkansas, the fireball would not get into the, into the control center. And it, that proved to be very effective. Uh, and the doors actually did do just that. So one of the things we sometimes get asked are, what happens if the doors malfunction and they won't open? Well, uh, we thought of that, and they use what's called a hand pump, and we have one right here. This is a hand pump. Uh, the hoses for this are missing. There should be some hoses that are wrapped up along the side here. But you can take those hoses and connect them to these little boxes right here, here and here, and when you do that, then you can use the pump and just pump it like this and pump the doors open by hand. Uh, and that, and there's a, one of these hand pumps that's stationed you know, at, at all of the doors. We don't have them all anymore, we just have a couple of them, but that's how they work. And there's a little gray box like this for each of the, each of the blast doors. All right, come on back out here. Uh, one, one other thing that can happen is, um, and this is kind of a dirty little secret that we don't really tell you about the tours, it is it's possible to open all the blast doors at once, even though we tell you that's not possible. It really is. And there are circumstances under which you would want to do that. For example, if you're doing a propellant upload or download, you're loading or unloading propellant from a missile, uh, and there's, there is the possibility of a fire or an explosion or some other calamity down here, then you would want to be able to get out of here in a hurry. And so under those circumstances, they actually do open all the doors at once. And I'll show you how that works right over here. This is something else you don't see on the tour because we can't move the door that far but I've arranged today so we can actually move the door. Ugh. This is the hydraulic mechanism that actually operates the locking pins for the door. Uh, and so once you get past blast door 6, the main door, you can open all the doors just by manually pressing down on the valves like that, and all the doors will go open. Um, incidentally, sometime in the 70s, somebody figured that out. <laughs> it occurred to someone that, wait a minute, if a bad guy could sort of bring their own hand pump with them and pump the door six open, then they're just, they're in to the complex. There's nothing you can do to stop them. And so they thought, oh, wait a minute, that's not such a great idea. And so what they did to, to counteract that is they installed what amounts to a huge night latch. And here it is. So usually what happens at five o'clock or you know, whatever the maintenance people go home for the day, you take this big hook and you put it in this little latch right here and you crank it down and then blast door seven cannot be opened under any circumstances. So, they thought about that. Another thing that can happen, by the way, these are the locking pins right here. There are four of them on each door. 
Uh, and they're gigantic pins that will, are pumped out and, and go in the little, little uh, divots on them. And this is the door right here. And if the doors are open for an extended period of time, like they might be during a propellant loading operation, the pins have a tendency to drift out kind of on their own. And if you're not paying attention to that, and you decide you're going to close the doors, the doors will crash into the pins. And that's why all of our doors have these little divots in them right here from when that actually happened. Um, maintenance guys just hate it when that happens because it compromises the seals on the doors. The other thing they don't like, maintenance guys don't like, is they don't want you to slam the door. Uh, because even if the pins are okay, if you slam the door, it rings like a bell. And it, there's a little neoprene seal that runs all the way around here, and you're in danger of deforming that seal to the point where it just won't seal anymore. Uh, so what happens if you find yourself trapped in this little room without a hand pump, for example, and uh, the hydraulic system is, is malfunctioned, and you're just stuck in here? Well, there's actually, uh, I've been in a couple sites that have been excavated. In fact, you can see there's four little holes right here. There used to be a little sign right here. Someday we'll get a replica made. And there was a sign with emergency instructions on there about what to do if you find yourself stuck in here. And instruction number one was, remain calm. Uh, and uh, down the list, it says, uh, you know, if you need more air to breathe, you can remove these little wing nuts right here. And you can put your mouth up to this little hole and it goes all the way through the door and you can suck air in from the outside. Now, I don't know about you, but I would not want to be doing that for very long before I got rescued out of here. So that's what these little, uh, these are called breather holes, strangely enough. And you can also use the breather holes, uh, and this was, they did this in Rock, Kansas, I think they did it in the Arkansas accident as well. Uh, they have what's called a portable vapor detector. It's got a long pole that's the sensor pole on this thing, and they can push the pole, the little sensor, through there and read uh, if, to detect if there are toxic vapors on the other side of the door. So that's another reason that you might want to uh, use these at some point. Um, what else? Oh, you know something? Let's talk about how strong the doors are. This is a big deal. Um, so when you take a tour, the guides will tell you and this is true, that the doors will stand off an overpressure of a thousand pounds per square inch. So you don't need to know anything about pounds per square inch. You just need a little perspective. So the doors will stand off a thousand pounds per square inch. Your home, your stick-built home, would be entirely flattened at about five pounds per square inch. So at a thousand PSI, we are pretty secure down here. Now, a lot of the guides will say, well, this is like the damage that would uh, be inflicted on your home uh, in a tornado or a hurricane. And I have a lot of problems with that analogy because high winds are not the same as a shock wave. And in a nuclear detonation, it's not high winds we're talking about. It's a shock wave. And a shockwave, how a shockwave forms is that when a nuclear bomb explodes, and this happens in a matter of microseconds, you get this immense fireball. And the fireball expands so rapidly, it pushes air out ahead of it. And that air becomes so highly compressed that it behaves like a solid object. So you have this essentially solid wall of air zooming across the landscape, initially at supersonic speed, but at, at distance it slows way down, of course, but it's no less solid at that point. So you have this solid wall of air, looks like a solid object, sweeping over the landscape, literally plowing away everything in its path like some high-speed bulldozer. This is not high winds we're talking about, this is a shock wave. Uh, and five PSI, five pounds per square inch, that may not sound like very much, but if you were struck, if you were topside and you were struck by a 5 PSI shockwave, that is an event you would never forget. Uh, you, you might possibly be deafened from that because the shockwave would blow out your eardrums, 
Uh, you could suffer lung damage because the shock wave could, could theoretically explode your lungs, uh, give you a collapsed lung maybe. Uh, you would certainly be thrown or you know, pushed a considerable distance by the shock wave, you'd probably end up breaking bones. Uh, so this is a this would be a very unpleasant experience. So even though five psi doesn't sound like much, it is a real significant event. Uh, the blast valves in the control center and the silo are designed to close at two pounds per square inch. And even that is going to break windows everywhere. Um, so this is a big deal. So so think of it this way. Uh, with respect to high winds and a shock wave, that, that you can stand up in a 30 mile per hour wind, but you cannot stand up in front of a 30 mile per hour bus. And that's the difference between high winds and a shock wave. So that's why I don't really like this tornado hurricane analogy, because it doesn't really get to the, the heart of what's going on and what the, the blast doors are really designed to protect against is an event something like that. So. There you go, more than you ever wanted to know about the blast doors and the overpressure system, so thanks for watching.